Okay, so um, this is going to be a video about a high voltage power supplies for tube amplifiers. And uh, as you saw probably in my uh, sort of warning introduction slide, uh, you know, uh, obviously high voltage power supplies contain high voltage. So um, keep that in mind. Uh, high voltage can overcome the resistance of your body and then you become the load, and um, if it travels through you, uh, it can wreak havoc, especially if it travels through your chest, it can kill you. So, um, if you don't feel comfortable working on high voltage circuits, please uh, don't try to construct any of these things. You can still watch the video um, so you can understand, and just, um, you know, it'll be informative or whatever, but, uh, you know, um, if you don't feel comfortable, uh, you know, keeping yourself safe doing high voltage stuff, then um, please don't. <laughs> also, disclaimer, it's not my fault if you kill yourself. Anyway, um, this is, yeah, like I said, this is going to be a video about high voltage power supplies for tube amps and uh, sort of what they have traditionally looked like and um, ways to improve them or modernize them. And uh, we'll sort of culminate with the sort of power supplies that I like to put in my tube amps. I'd like to, another little disclaimer here. Uh, I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm sort of a uh, enthusiastic, advanced-level hobbyist, and um, but I do have a lot of practical experience. I've built um, a bunch of these kinds of power supplies and put them in amps, and um, they're extremely effective. So, um, all that out of the way, uh, let's get started here. So, what we're looking at with our first uh, graphic here is. Um, the way that power supplies and tube amps have traditionally been been accomplished. And so if you look at any uh, sort of tube amplifier um, from the past, uh, you're going to see something that looks almost exactly like this. And so you've got your, uh, your uh, transformer over here, you've got mains in over here, and you've got your high voltage winding, which will be center tapped. That's the traditional way of doing it. And then you'll have a... Uh, your rectifier tube. So in the old days you didn't have uh, silicon diodes, you had uh, tube rectifiers. They work the same way though basically. Um, and you can see this tube is a dual diode and so we're doing a full full wave rectification here. And then there'll be your primary filter cap, or I mean I shouldn't say primary, your first filter cap right here. Um, you'll have an inductor of some kind and then you'll have uh, your primary filter cap and then this is your high voltage out to the rest of your system here. And there will be filtering beyond this for the uh, driver stages um, that I'm not including here, but this is where the center tap for your output transformers um, and your primary plate voltage and current is coming from is gonna be this point right here. And so this works very well. There's nothing wrong with this um, per se. There are things that could be improved, but at the time, this was about as good as you could get. Some of the major problems with this um, design is tube rectifiers um, are, are go bad pretty regularly, um, even more so than, than tubes. Uh, tubes need to be replaced um, when they sort of, when, when they get weak is what they call it. It's basically when the cathode stops emitting properly, but t uh, <laughs> tube rectifiers rarely get to that point. Usually they uh, they fail more more excitingly, more spectacularly than that. And so um, something will short inside the tube and something will melt and uh, the fuse in your transformer primary will trip and you'll have to replace this and hopefully nothing else <clears throat> got destroyed along the way. So that's one problem with tube rectifiers. Uh, another problem with tube rectifiers is that um, they have a large internal resistance. So they try and put the cathode as close to the plates as possible. So this isn't a very good diagram. Really, this should look like this, you know, like... So yeah, if you ever look inside a rectifier, you'll notice that the cathode is physically as close to the plates as they can get them. This is to reduce the um, internal resistance of the tube, but it still remains pretty high. And so the tube look, acts like a diode. Uh, double diode, but it also acts like a, uh, a resistor. And so voltage drop occurs across that, and so it's sort of a Im pretty imperfect device. Uh, it has some positive traits as well. They usually switch pretty quietly. Um, they can usually handle pretty high voltages, and of course they look amazing. Um, they're usually the, the brightest glowing tube in your amplifier. 
and um, a lot of them are sort of large and impressive looking and so you know that's something to be considered um, and I have put rectifiers on things for that reason and so uh, no judgment here but uh, from a technical standpoint they could be a lot better but let's just talk about how this actually works in practice so you've got your center tap grounded here and so when the AC waveform is doing sort of this um, over here on this main winding you get current and voltage going like this and over here you don't get anything this way because um, that diode is currently off and then when the AC swings the other way like this you get current and voltage uh, doing doing this this sort of thing excuse my sloppiness there and so what you end up with um, as it goes like this is you end up with uh, over here um, full wave rectification which looks like this like that and so that's excellent that's DC now but you'll notice that it's um, quite lumpy and lumpy is not good for audio power supplies or any power supplies really and so the trick now is to try and uh, sort that out and so the first thing you do is you put a cap to ground here and so a cap to ground is great because uh, capacitors short um, they act like dead shorts to um, AC signals and the uh, it'll be sized such that it will be uh, shorting the uh, 120 Hertz now that's coming in. The reason it's 120 is because over here you had um, you had uh, 60 from here to here 60 Hertz but now you can see we've got half of that there so it's 120 and so you get 120 coming through which is actually easier to filter out because it's a higher frequency of course and so I guess there's that although 120 is also more objectionable as something coming through than 60 usually anyway um, so a lot of that 60 Hertz um, ripple is going to go straight down through here and that's good the largest larger this value is the more that 60 Hertz gets shorted down this way and then you've got another component here this is the inductor and uh, some of that 60 Hertz is going to come through here and inductors uh, act like current sources which means uh, you can't change the current through them instantaneously there's a time constant the capacitors are the same way they have their except they're a voltage source and so you can't change the voltage at this point instantaneously there's a time constant and so not being able to change the voltage instantaneously is good here for moving ripple and in series not being able to change the current instantaneously is good for ripple uh, removing it obviously and so by the time the signal gets over here um, you know you're probably looking at you know something like this which is really nice and then of course we've got another capacitor to ground this is our main filter cap and that takes uh, the current source so if we didn't have this cap here um, the power supply would be filtered somewhat but um, we would have an output that had a very high impedance and you don't want that uh, you want a very low impedance uh, so the way you do that is you put another cap to ground here caps once again act like voltage sources and so um, you end up with even less ripple you know maybe just a little tiny bit here and you end up with a very low output impedance over a certain frequency range de uh, dependent on the value of this capacitor so this all works very well um, this capacitor when you have a tube rectifier you have to be careful about the size of this capacitor because tube rectifiers have a maximum current and it's not very high and if you exceed that you can damage tube rectifier and cause it to fail prematurely and so if you go to the spec sheet of a tube rectifier um, it'll tell you uh, capacitive input the maximum capacitive input that it can use and if you exceed that um, you'll have fireworks in your in your rectifier so that's a problem because ideally you'd want this capacitor to be large you know as large as you can make it uh, practically speaking um, because the larger it is uh, the more that six, uh, 120 hertz you get shorted there um, really larger the better in all of these as far as values go um, within reason and so uh, you limit the size of this one to protect your your rectifier here and uh, the size of this guy right here 
the value of that guy is determined by basically how much money you want to spend and how much room you have in your chassis. Um, large, high current, high inductance value inductors um, are expensive and very, very big. And they've got other problems too, but we'll get to that later. Um, and then you can make this cap much larger because uh, remember the current through the inductor can't change instantly and so there's a little bit of a soft start of current charging this capacitor at startup. Anyway, that's power supply um, as it's traditionally been seen. Alright, so here we have our second diagram here and you'll notice that um, we've entered the modern era and we've got some uh, regular old silicon diodes over here. And these act exactly like the tube rectifier, except for a couple of things. Um, I didn't mention this before, but the tube rectifier also required um, the cathode to be actively heated. This usually requires a five volt winding on your transformer and some three to five amps of current. And so um, it's a lot of power that you're gonna lose there. Anyway, um, you haven't got that problem with these. Also, they just have your typical forward voltage drop of less than a volt or whatever to turn them on so they're really uh, low resistance. So you're going to end up with more voltage over here because you'll have less of it dropped over there. Also, um, silicon diodes uh, typically are very high current devices. Um, they can also be high voltage devices so they're pretty good in this situation. Um, because they're such high current devices, the value now of, of this guy can be uh, ramped up. So it's a more effective filter and same thing over here through the inductor to the main filter gap. So that's the first improvement and you can see that on a lot of things. Now just uh, recall that we still are doing this sort of thing. One half of the transformer gets used in one cycle. That's this guy right here. And then on the other cycle um, the other half gets used like this. So only half of the transformer is being used um, for each uh, cycle there. So there's something that we can do that's better than this, and I'll show you what it is. All right, here's what's next. Now we have uh, something you've probably seen before. You see these everywhere now. That's called a bridge rectifier. And you'll notice that our, uh, our center tap is no longer grounded. Uh, now our ground is coming from the negative terminal of the bridge rectifier. Bridge rectifier is just four diodes instead of two. It's still a full wave rectifier. Um, but now what's happening is um, during one side of the cycle of the transformer, um, the, the current and the voltage are going like that. So you can see it's using the whole secondary of the transformer there. And then the second one, it's doing the opposite like this. So there's lots of tutorial videos out there on how bridge rectifiers work. Um, if you take a minute to just sort of think about the way the diodes are facing, you'll see how it works. Like, uh, for instance, uh, when it's coming this way, when the positive voltage is coming this way, it's going like this. Whee! <laughs> um, and then uh, during the negative one, it's coming back around. Um, so it's going to go the other way. But anyway, I'm not explaining this well because I wasn't prepared to explain this that well. But you can see now it comes uh, through this way. Mm -hmm. And so uh, during the negative, during the swing of the blue one, you're also getting it coming back like this. So it goes back like that. And then the red one um, is coming back like this. So yeah, it comes back like this. So anyway, the, the main point here is that it's a much more efficient way of using your transformer. And you'll once again get a voltage boost over here. So with a bridge rectifier, you get more voltage over there. Um, you don't need a center tap. So you can use a center tap transformer, obviously, but you can also use a non-center tap transformer, which a lot of modern ones are. And so that's helpful. Um, once again, it's got a high current capacity, so this value can be high. And everything over here is the same. So now what can we do? Um, next thing to look at is the inductor, like we said. This thing is uh, big and expensive. Another couple of drawbacks are that it um, 
is a big, big coil of wire, and it will have an electromagnetic field that is surrounding it. That's where it's charging its power, but it's also interacting with other components. So your output transformers, your input transformers, interstage transformers, or whatever, are going to couple with this somewhat, and you're going to get a little hum on the output, which is precisely the thing it's trying to eliminate. Um, it can actually cause. Um, there are good, good things about inductors as well. Um, one of the good things about inductors is they basically never go bad. Um, they almost never fail. It's basically just a big quill of wire around a block of iron, and um, they last forever. So, very, very reliable. So there's that. Anyway, what's next? All right, so here's something new. Um, you can replace the inductor with a uh, this device here. This is a high voltage end channel enhancement mode MOSFET. And um, it's in a configuration called source follower. What source follower means is it's just like a cathode follower if you're uh, familiar with that. Um, but the uh, source here follows the gate. And so um, if this were a tube, it just acts just like a tube, this would be the anode, this would be the cathode, and this would be the grid. And so, just like in a cathode follower, the uh, device uses all of its gain and transconductance to uh, force the source, or the cathode, to follow the grid, or the gate in this situation, up and down, using its own amplification, basically. So, with a, with a FET like this, um, the how, how on the device is, is determined um, just like a tube. It's determined by the voltage between the uh, cathode, or the source here, and the grid or the gate. And so it's usually a few volts to turn this off or on from the gate to the source here. And so when you've only got a few volts between full on and full off, you can see that any minor change over here or over here is going to adjust the, uh, the internal resistance of the device and um, so the source really can't get very far away from the gate because if the source were to go positive then it would very much, th that's the same thing as a grid t going negative and so it would very much turn off the device if it went positive and if it went negative that would be the same thing as the grid going positive positive. and if the grid goes positive um, it very much turns on the device and so it regulates itself right here um, so that the source always follows the uh, the gate. And so the positive side of this is that the source is uh, basically depend, the, the output of the source basically only depends on the gate and more or less ignores the drain here um, or the anode in this situation. And so what you want to do is supply the gate with a nice clean beautiful DC which is easy to do because uh, the nice thing about a MOSFET is that the gate is a voltage driven device it doesn't consume any current and so uh, you can use uh, very low current signal to drive it which means that you can make uh, a very very high value RC filter over here to drive it and get a very low noise DC signal here and so that translates to very low noise DC out here at the source and so it's a great device to put in a power supply um, for reducing hum. Um, so you'll notice uh, that we have a resistor and a capacitor over here connected to the gate. Um, this circuit is traditionally called a capacitance multiplier. It's called that because um, you're multiplying the effectiveness of this capacitor. So if you remove this and just put the capacitor there, the capacitor would be working with whatever the resistance, the impedance of the circuit is naturally, which is quite low. But when you put a resistor here, you start to increase the effectiveness of this capacitor for filter, filter, filtration. Um, so with an RC network, the effectiveness of the filter for removing ripple is increased anytime you increase the R or the C. And so in this situation, um, you've got a C that's more or less probably what this C is right here, but the R can be extremely high because this is a voltage device right here, and so it doesn't need any current to drive it. 
Um, uh, typically values for these guys right here would be something like 200k, and this would be something like 50 to 100 uh, microfarads. And that would give you a time constant um, somewhere in the, the 30 to 60 second range. Um, and so you can see there's also another benefit of this type of circuit, which is um, it's a soft start. So because the time constant here is in the 30 to 60 second range, um, remember the source follows the gate. And so full voltage will hop in here pretty quickly. Um, but remember the source follows the gate, and so this capacitor has to charge through this resistor, and it does so slowly over that time constant period. And so the voltage over here will start off down here at zero, and it will ramp up slowly to whatever your high voltage rail is going to be. Now this is a super simplified capacitance multiplier, and you wouldn't want to build it like this um, because there are certain things about MOSFETs that make them a little bit delicate. Um, but if you take certain precautions, um, they are very reliable and will last a long time. So let's look at what we have to do to make this a better circuit. All right, well I forgot. Uh, before we look at what we need to do to protect our MOSFET, um, let's look at one more thing we need to add here to make this uh, a better circuit. Um, you see the only difference between this and the last circuit is I've added one resistor here. And uh, the reason we've done that is you notice now that instead of just having an RC here to run, oh, we've added this here as well. I'll, I'll explain that in a second. But let's pay attention to this right now. So we did have a big RC here to run the gate, um, but we've added another R to ground here. And so what we've created here is a high value voltage divider. And so what this does is depending on the value or the ratio of these two, you change this value, you actually begin to drop this voltage which would naturally have increased up to the value of this voltage up here. Um, but you're making it so that its final voltage that rest at, rests at is not this voltage, but slightly lower. And so depending on the value of this voltage divider. And that's um, desirable for a certain reason. The reason is that there is something called dropout voltage with this device that needs a certain voltage drop across it um, so that it will continue regulating, continue acting like a filter for the for the, uh, the, the, the the ripple over here. And so the reason why you care about that is that if your current demand over here ever changes, um, let's say your current goes from 100 milliamps to 200 milliamps, like in a class AB amplifier, um, what's going to happen is the voltage over here and, and over here is going to drop because as you ask more current from this over here, the internal resistance of the, uh, the winding and just everything else in here, whatever you're doing, um, is going to cause the voltage to drop somewhat. And so if the voltage drops over here suddenly, this value of voltage on here doesn't change quickly. Remember, it has a 30 to 60 second time constant. And so if this voltage takes a dive, it can actually drop below this voltage right here. And if it does that, then your regulator, I mean, sorry, your, your source follower, your capacitance multiplier has dropped out and it's no longer filtering. And so you'll have a situation where during transients of your AB amplifier, um, only during the transients, uh, ripple will suddenly come through, and so that can, that can, that's undesirable, obviously, and it can make your amplifier sound harsh on transients, um, so that you don't want that. And so the, what you do is you add this resistor in down here, and you drop the voltage here, so that there's always a voltage drop across the device, and you set that voltage drop to be in excess of the voltage drop over here under maximum load, and so it's easy to determine this. Um, you just hook your multimeter up to the circuit here and here and then um, take your device from idle over here your amplifier and just hit it with a you know the maximum signal that it's likely to encounter and if it's an AB the current will change dramatically and the voltage will drop across the device 
and if it ever reaches the dropout voltage of the device, which is a few volts usually, um, you need to increase, I'm sorry, decrease this value right here. And you decrease that value until your voltage drop across the device is sufficient so that it doesn't drop out under transient load. Um, so that's helpful. You'll also notice that this has the added benefit of uh, if you have too much voltage over here, like you couldn't find a transformer that was exactly the right voltage for your circuit, you can uh, tail your voltage over here a bit, keeping in mind that you need to sync this device, heat sync it, because uh, the more voltage you drop across for the same amount of current, all things being equal, the more heat it's dissipating according to Ohm's law. And so there's that. Now, if your device is class A and the current never changes because it's class A, um, you don't have to worry about this as much and you can even eliminate this resistor and just go back to the minimum dropout voltage of the device. So there's that. Also, we've added this resistor here. This is a grid stopper. It's just like on any tube circuit that you've worked with. Um, the gate in this situation or the grid on your tube has a tendency to oscillate. And if you take a 1K or a, a 5K or something like that and just stick it right on the pin of your, on the gate of your device here, it stops any errant oscillations that may occur. So that's what that about. So we've Im improved the circuit a little bit here. Um, let's talk about further improvements. All right, so let's talk about protecting the MOSFET. Uh, the MOSFET has a pretty large drain source voltage, um, depending on the one you pick. Obviously, you're picking a high voltage one, and so pick one that's higher voltage than the voltage of your supply over here. Um, when in operation, um, the device will drop very little voltage, maybe 20 or 30 volts or something like that, uh, depending on the value of this guy over here. Could be as little as just 5 or 6 volts, depending on how you're running it. Um, but remember, when you turn this on, full voltage comes in here immediately, and uh, this doesn't change for 30, it doesn't come up to voltage for 30 or 60 seconds. And so during turn on, your device will see across it the full voltage of your power supply. So the rating of this needs to be up to spec. So if you've got a 300 volt power supply here, this needs to be appropriately, um, you know, maybe four or five or 600 volts there, just to be safe. Um, also, uh, so if you exceed that, you'll damage your device, obviously. Um, the other thing that these come with is a, a grid or a gate source uh, voltage maximum rating. And um, if you exceed that, you'll damage your device. Under normal conditions, like we discussed, the source follows the grid or the gate. And so you don't have to worry about that so much. But um, sometimes when you turn off the amplifier, so when the whole thing's up and running, you've got high voltage over here, you turn it off, the voltage over here will drop quickly maybe, probably, depending on the way things are. The voltage over here, maybe not so much. And so also, even if this, so yeah, the voltage drop quickly over there. So obviously the voltage on the, on the gate here can't drop quickly, it only drops over 30 or 60 seconds. And so you've got that to deal with. Also the voltage over here may drop quite quickly as well. And so you may end up with a situation where the drain and the source are suddenly down close to zero volts, but the, the gate, the, yeah, the gate of the grid here, as we're thinking about it, will be still up at whatever the full voltage was for a period of time. And that will quickly exceed the source uh, gate voltage, which is typically in the uh, 15 to 30 volt range. And so one thing you can do is to place a zener here um, with a value that's within that. So it'll be above the turn on voltage of your device. So your device will turn on. So there'll be sufficient difference between source and the gate to turn on. Um, so it'll be higher than that, but lower than the source gate voltage max, the zener right here. And uh, that prevents the uh, gate from getting away from the source. So you can imagine if this is still some hundreds of volts and this goes down to zero, then um, your, your uh, current, will, your positive current, will then uh, go out this way to normalize those and, and save your device. And so 
some uh, MOSFETs actually include this on the chip now. Um, so look in the spec sheet of your MOSFET that you're using and see um, this may already exist. Um, although usually you want to add it anyway, and here's the reason why. You'll see there's another resistor we've added here. If you're uh, clever about this, you put a low value resistor here, which is basically a current sense resistor, and then you you do the math and you look at the turn on voltage of your device right here. And if you choose this value and this value properly, you can also use this as a current limiter in case of shorts over here. So the voltage will drop across this resistor. If it drops enough, what's going to happen is electrons are going to flow in here and make this more negative and turn off your device. And so you just use Ohm's law to de and the turn on voltage of your uh, your MOSFET in the spec sheet to determine these two values. And so you're kind of killing two birds with one stone here. You're protecting the gate source VMAX from being exceeded, and you're also protecting the whole circuit here from a short. Um, so you're limiting the maximum current with this right here. You're also marginally increasing the effectiveness of this filter right here because you're putting an R right there in front of it. So that's all great. Here's another diode right here. This allows, so generally speaking, um, it would be more positive over here and more negative over here when the circuit is operating. When you turn the circuit off, there may be situations where if you short cycle the circuit, turn it on and off quickly. Or if something goes haywire down here, um, there might be a situation where this becomes more positive and this is more negative. And that's not a good situation for the device. And so you put a diode here, which just allows uh, positive current flow to go back that way in such situation. This is also included within most MOSFETs on the chip. So look on your device spec sheet and see if it has one of these. If it does, don't worry about it. If it doesn't, uh, go ahead and include it. Obviously, this will need to be a high voltage diode. Yeah. So that is sort of the final version of the uh, the power supply I want to show you. This is what I use in most of my designs. It's super effective. These devices are very cheap, much smaller, easier to use than a typical inductor. You do have to sync them to the chassis or onto a heat sink, um, but they actually dissipate surprisingly little power, all things considered. Um, the voltage, this is just like a, a traditional tube power supply in that the voltage over here is going to depend on the voltage over here. This goes up, this is going to go up, that goes down, that goes down. This is unregulated, and that's perfectly fine for most tube amps. But if you'd like to do regulation, um, this can be very quickly and easily turned into um, a regulator. Now, it's not the best regulator in the world, but it's pretty good, and I've used it before, and it works well, so let me show you that. Okay, so here's one more iteration of the circuit, which turns it into a, you know, a pretty good regulator. And um, you'll notice that really the only thing we've changed over here is instead of that resistor and that resistive divider, we've now got a Zener diode. And Zener diodes, when they're on, when they're reverse biased, they always drop whatever voltage they're rated at. Now that's not exactly true. They're dependent on current somewhat, but they're pretty stable. And so the value of this now, you need to take into consideration the dissipation of this when it's on. Usually you will not find a single Zener that is the voltage out that you want. Um, so you may have to put a string of these Zeners, but we're just going to put one there for uh, sake of explanatory power there. But imagine that if you needed to get up to some 300 odd volts over here, you could just put a bunch of 39 volt Zeners in a row and they would each drop 39 volts, obviously, and add up to whatever voltage you want out over here. Um, you need to use Ohm's law and the max dissipation of those Zeners. To obviously, don't run them at max dissipation. Run them at like a quarter of their max dissipation or something like that. And the, use Ohm's law to adjust this value here. This value here, which was previously something like a 50 or 100 UF, um, is no longer acting like a large RC here to filter this input because now we've got regulated voltage coming in here. But because Zeners are pretty noisy devices, you could put like a film cap here, you know, uh, one or two UF or whatever, um, make sure it's rated for whatever voltage so you're going to drop across these Zeners. And um, 
that will drop, that, that will short some of that high voltage, I'm sorry, some of that uh, sort of broad spectrum noise that's drop, that's coming from this scener over here. Once again, we've got our, uh, our grid stopper. And so everything else over here is the same. Um, obviously, the uh, source follows the gate. And the gate is now going to be uh, determined by the value of these uh, zeners and this resistor. And so you end up with regulated output. So as long as the voltage over here doesn't drop below the dropout voltage of this device um, plus the desired output voltage, um, you're going to get nice regulated output over here. And this is a great way to uh, make a little screen supply. Um, one word of caution about regulation, <clears throat> if you don't need to regulate, um, you probably don't want to regulate, because if you regulate one thing, you really want to regulate everything. And the reason why is, let's say you're regulating your screen supply here. Now, if you didn't regulate your bias supply, for instance, if the vol wall voltage over here goes up, what'll happen is this voltage will stay the same but your bias supply, because it now has more voltage to work with, will go negative. And so if your screen supply stays the same, even if your plate supply goes up with the wall, it will more or less ignore your plate. Um, that's what the screen is about anyway. And if your bias supply drops, um, your bias point will also drop. And so you'll end up in a situation where when the wall voltage goes up, your plate voltage will go up and your, and your uh, your, your, your current through your tube will go down. Um, or if you regulate your plate, um, but you don't regulate your bias supply. So if you're regulating your screen or your plate, you should probably also regulate your bias supply as well. That way your operating points don't go crazy when your wall voltage changes, which it will always do. Like in my house, air conditioner turns on, or we use the little electric oven or whatever, or it's day or it's night because the people in the neighborhood are using their conditioners, whatever. Voltage goes up and down over here. Um, that's just a fact of life. Also, you take it to your friend's house and he's got, you know, 115 instead of your 125 or whatever. So just keep that in mind. That if you regulate one thing, you probably want to regulate everything. Um, so there's that, but anyway, you can turn this, um, easily turn it into a nice little regulated supply. Um, also, just keep in mind, um, the more you regulate down, the more voltage drop across your device. For a given current, your dissipation, power dissipation is gonna go up and you're gonna need to heat sink more. But anyway, um, this is how I design most of the power supplies for my amps, um, um, I, bug amps. And so I just wanna do a quick and dirty sort of like explanation of what's going on here. These are extremely effective filters. Um, you can get basically zero ripple out over here. Um, the last amp that I built, um, none of the output ripple. So it had about 2, 0.2 millivolts of output ripple when the amp was done. And I traced the circuit down and all of it was coming from the AC heaters of the output tubes because I'd regulated DC, the input tube heaters. And so this, the power supply was contributing basically zero of that. And it's all thanks to this little guy here, super effective filter. So I recommend it, uh, give it a try and see what you think. And that's it.